Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the City of Glendale's Commission on the Status of Women. Our meetings are now open to the public and can still be viewed on local cable, Charter Cable Channel 6 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. The meeting can also be viewed online at www.glendaleca.gov. By scrolling all the way to the bottom of the page and selecting live streaming, which is the third icon from the left. Members of the public are welcome to provide public comments and questions in person or can call in during the meeting at 818-937-8100. City staff will submit these questions and comments in real time to the appropriate person during the commission on the status of women meeting. May I have roll call please? Yes, Commissioners Bursanian? Present. Ojayan? Present. Chair Lambolat? Present. Darian? Present. Tatian? Present. Ex officio member Gonzalez? And ex officio member Voss? Present. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is the report of the recorder, the agenda for, for the February 13, 2023 regular meeting of the Commission on the Status of Women was posted on February 9, 2023 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item are introductions and presentations. We have one presentation by the Armenian Bar Association Pro Bono Clinic Services Providing Legal Support to Women and Girls in Need by Ida Anbarian. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Ida Anbarian, and I feel very honored and excited to be here and to be given the opportunity to talk to you all about the Armenian Bar Association's Pro Bono Clinic. For over 33 years, the Pro Bono Clinic has provided essential legal services to many segments of the community, serving as a vital resource to those in need. I feel privileged to be part of this undertaking and to be helping many Glendale residents, uh, especially women with their legal predicaments. I've been with the Pro Bono Clinic for a little over a year and a half. Throughout my time at the Pro Bono Clinic, I watched our clientele grow significantly. Currently, we are assisting about five to six new clients a week, with a very large majority of our clients being women. It is important for me to highlight that the clinic is welcoming to everyone, regardless of their race, their culture, their religion, their ethnic background, and even gender. We provide a helping hand to anyone who is in need of legal services and to whom we can provide guidance through the many dimensions of the legal system. As such, our clientele is very diverse in its background. However, a very significant portion consists of low-income recent immigrants who do not speak any English or very little English. The Pro Bono Clinic is located at the Adult Recreation Center at 201 East Colorado Street in Glendale. Currently, our office hours are held between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. on Saturdays, and we welcome walk-ins. Uh, so no appointments are necessary, but if anyone would like to make an appointment, they can call the number that's provided right there. Recently, in conjunction with the General Pro Bono Clinic, the Armenian Bar Association has also embarked on a mission to assist victims of domestic violence. By establishing a domestic violence program, the first step that the Armenian Bar Association took in this endeavor was to collaborate with the very first responders within the Glendale community, which is the Armenian Relief Society, the Glendale Police Department, and local churches. With this collaboration, the Armenian Bar Association has been able to reach its clientele. And since the program began, we have assisted nearly eight victims of domestic violence in different capacities. And our, the numbers are still growing week by week. Even though each and every one of our domestic violence cases have been quite unique in the types of issues they have presented, our clients have shown to be sharing very similar challenges. 
And it is our mission to help our clients overcome those challenges. For instance, many domestic violence victims have been isolated from their femmes and families for many years. They are completely financially uh, dependent on their abuser, and many of them have repeatedly fallen into a cycle of abuse, um, returning to their abusers whenever they feel that they have no other vital option. Um, Victims of domestic violence are thus one of the most vulnerable members of our community. Cultural ideals about traditional gender roles Shame and humiliation, which is also embedded in society, also plays a role in adding to the challenges of seeking help. It is with this understanding that the clinic uses an approach with heightened sensitivity in dealing with our domestic violence victims. To date, we have assisted victim, victims of abuse with various services from preparing and filing restraining orders to locating free child care services to translation services and helping file for, even helping file for attorney's fees. To discuss an example of a domestic violence case, I would like to present a hypothetical case that is very representative of the experiences which I have seen some of our clients have. And the reason I'm using hypotheticals because I do not want to expose anyone's actual mm -hmm. issues in public. Our hypothetical client is a young woman who does not speak any English at all. She has no family in the United States and is forced to survive with her young toddler all on her own after having finally built the courage to leave her abuser. The woman is seeking assistance with her divorce proceedings that she has filed in a court that, that was filed by the abuser in a court in a county that is hours away from where she lives. She does not own a car or drive and supports herself and her, ch uh, her child through multiple jobs. Imagine the hardship she has to go through in commuting, commuting with public transportation hours long to get to a court hearing after taking time off of multiple jobs that she has, only to be sitting in a hearing where she has no idea what's going on. The abuser, on the other hand, makes substantial income and is represented by a reputable family law attorney through each and every stage of the process. And it is at this point where our services become really vital to this hypothetical client. We are a vital resource because not only are we able to discuss with her and educate her on the rights that she has, but we can also help guide her on the types of motions and requests she can ask the court to do, such as request to transfer her case to a closer location to her, or request to have attorney's fees be paid to her by, by her abuser. And so it is that for that reason that the pro bono clinic has extended its, um, its reach, its clientele reach, even though it is for everybody, to also address uh, uh, victims of domestic <coughs> abuse. And with this, I conclude my presentation and open for any questions or comments. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Brusselian? Um, hi, hi, thank you for coming. Okay. Um, based on this hypothetical situation, how would you assist this woman to get to the uh, courthouse and get there and childcare and all that's involved? So since its inception, since we started the program, I have, and with the help of our volunteer family law attorneys who have guided me through some of these resources, um, we have so, sort of addressed each and every issue separately. So for instance, childcare services, I, I have uh, reached out to different um, uh, organizations that provide free childcare services and have gotten a list of them that do provide it and provided it to the client to reach out and get that. I know there are women who are pregnant, who have a toddler, who don't have family. What do they do when the baby is born? They have a newborn, they're recovering from birth, and they have a toddler. And so there are resources for victims out there. And so I try to get the client in touch with those resources. As far as which motions to file, how to file that, what to request, and what is out there, 
our pro, our pro bono clinic volunteer family law attorneys have been really, really good resource for me. I'm not a family law attorney. I don't understand the process. It's confusing for me. I can only imagine how confusing it is for the victim. And so they have guided me through how I can advise our clients. And I can let them know the, the form number, how they should fill it out, and so forth. And I help them through that. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Oh, uh, go down the row. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, my question is, um, where do you obtain or how do you obtain your funding and sponsorship? Because I'm sure this, you know, costs money to, you know, run the operation. Well, most of our operation is run by volunteers and volunteer work but also we are part of the CDBG grant program, and mm -hmm. so the resources that we obtain from them, from that program, is what funds some of my services. Of course, even for my um, partner who's a legal professional, who does the intake for clients who walk in, um, for both of us, a lot of our work is covered by some of that grant, but some of it is also volunteer. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, and follow up to that so yes. the rent for the uh, place you don't have to pay for that or um, it's with the city of Glendale oh okay yes. all right okay just curious yeah <laughs> thank you Commissioner, Commissioner Kajayan thank you for this informative information of course. my question is uh, do you provide them I help them with the shelter where to stay so that we also, so any services that we cannot provide, we um, have a list. So what we did, I think last year when we discussed creating a roadmap for our clients who come in, so that you know any client that walks in who hasn't been helped with shelter, who hasn't been helped with childcare, who hasn't been helped with um, also counseling and therapy, we have a list of organizations that in the Glendale community that do provide those services. Like YWCA or? Yes, the YWCA is one of them that provides child care and also provides um, shelter. The Armenian Relief Society has yes. also been really great in assisting um, victims of abuse with shelter um, and so forth. Thank you. Yes. Sure, go ahead. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Of course. Uh, my question was, how do um, your clients hear about your services? Are they being um, referred through other organizations? Are there pro bono clinics you put together? How, how do they learn to come to you? So the first thing we did is that's what we focused on. How do we reach the victims? And I think the first step we took was to collaborate with the first responders, which is the Glendale Police Department. We're also in collaborations with them to help them with training on how to address the cultural differences um, and how to identify that. And then also local churches have reached out to us. We have collaborated with them to let them know we have these services. And so they have reached out to us. So a lot of victims will trust you know, the local priest um, and they'll go to them for help. The city of Glendale has also sent some um, you know, referred some members, and uh, sometimes they will call and present it as a divorce case. And it's not until I have several conversations with them where I find out, no, the, the divorce proceedings are happening because of the rampant physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we've had that as well. Thank you. In, uh, Greer? So I was just wondering how many attorneys you have on your staff and kind of what your staff looks like for the pro bono clinic? Our staff, our, our paid staff was just two um, legal professionals. Um, I'm helping as well and we have a list of 35 attorneys who are uh, providing their knowledge and expertise um, in various different legal niches and so they're volunteering so that that comprises our Working staff. Okay, thank you so much. 
And I had a question. Um, it doesn't sound like the, the attorneys on your staff actually represent the clients in the legal proceedings. Is that right? That's correct. We but don't actually represent our clients. We don't go to court with them, but we have had certain very emergency cases where our volunteer attorneys have volunteered to do so. Um, we had a woman who was being abused by her neighbor um, who was calling the cops on her almost daily for various things and she wasn't able to sleep. She had lost her husband. She had lost her son. She was all alone and um, the neighbor had put a restraining order on her and another call would have put her in a vulnerable situation of being arrested. Mm -hmm. Basically there's an active restraining order against her. And so one of our volunteer attorneys was able to go and fight the restraining order and put it all to rest. She Great. was an elderly lady. And <laughs> So sweet, so wonderful service. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. Great, thank you so much. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, really thank appreciate you so it. Thank, thank you, you so much you. for coming. Yes. Have a good day. Next item on the agenda, please. Next item is oral communications. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. We have one caller for oral communications. Okay. Our caller is Karen Katchler. Karen, you're on air. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, good afternoon, commissioners. And um, my name is Karen Kachler. I am a local resident of Glendale, and I'm also a student at GCC. And um, I recently started a student club there called Advocating for Humanity. At GCC, um, as I realized in my studies in my first course there uh, for child development, I wanted to st um, study for a PhD. And I realized that what is being taught there is not only outdated materials from 100 years ago to like 20 years ago, it is still outdated. It's harmful to children, it is uh, full of supremacists and even racist and ableist um, information. And I was so appalled and I spoke to the professor and realized she did not have a clue of nonviolent, trauma-informed understanding of human beings. And um, she didn't know what I was talking about, even though I sent her um, research articles from PubMed, uh, like um, and the Institute of Health, the CDC uh, website on um, ACES. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, um, adverse childhood experiences, um, which very much have to do with uh, domestic violence in the home. And not only it, uh, includes abuse, but also neglect. And um, what isn't said is that, and now um, I have so kindly asked Raina to, uh, Raina to provide the infographics from ECHO um, training. And I'm an ECHO trained um, nonviolent and trauma informed parenting and child educator, um, also in addition to being a student and a Glendale resident. If that, is that visible now to everybody? I'm not sure. Can you all see on the screen the power over versus power with dynamic? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, good. So I briefly wanted to uh, give you an overview of what, yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you. So now I see it as well. Um, what uh, is so important and is really more than just a domestic violence on, on girls and women, it also can be domestic violence from parents in general um, against their sons and or a woman against a um, husband or a trans child, LGBTQ or a disabled um, or autistic child. It doesn't matter, it's, it's, it's really all about when we take away what differentiates us and, and just look at our being human, we all suffer 
when we are being treated well, on the left-hand side in this orange column, where it says um, non-trauma informed, that is called a power over dynamic. When people treat us in the way you can see on the left-hand side, I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but you have it available. Um, and Rainia can share this email with you. I also emailed it to Diane. And um, when we are treated on the, with these sentences on the left, which is the current way of how students are treated by their professors, how teachers talk to children, how, and so on and so forth. Anybody who has more power because he's in a more powerful position and or more abilities than a little child or even an employee, um, we all, all humans, no matter where we come from, what history we have, what nationality, uh, we suffer in this uh, on the left column. And what we need to get to is the blue column. We need to understand and treat every human being in a completely different way. And I have done this in my preschool when I ran a preschool in Eagle Rock uh, for eight years. I've done this successfully with every single child and their parents that came to my school that I was so gentle and I developed a curriculum for that. And so I'm, um, I would like to uh, show briefly the next slide, if possible. Can the next slide come up? Um, yes, physical impact is up. Yeah, physical I'm sorry, yeah, so there might be a delay in what I see on YouTube. Um, the physical impact on, on, on track, because it's still showing the, the, the trauma-informed care. One. So the physical impact of trauma, you can see there's a little girl in the middle, but really it's, thank you, now I can see it. Um, Karin, you're out of time. Thank you for your comment. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. Well, thank you. Can I think? Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, please. Um, before I go to the next item, I'd like to make a comment. Yes. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Suzy Abadjian. And as you know, Christine Powers, who was the staff member assigned to the commission by the city manager's office, has accepted a new position uh, and will no longer be assisting the commission. And due to staffing shortages, I have agreed to take the commission on. I'm very interested in the work of the commission because I'm deeply committed to issues impacting women in our community. Um, and uh, I'm interested in advocating for women's issues. Going forward, my office will be assisting with all the operations of the commission, uh, working directly with Chair Lambelot and the commissioners. And uh, we are in the process of hiring an analyst who will be working with the commission directly. Uh, we are hoping to have someone in that position in the coming months. And um, my team and I are looking forward to supporting the commission in this capacity. Thank you, Dr. Abajian. Um, welcome. Um, Dr. Bajian and I have met a few times to go over various things that um, we're, we've been working on, the agenda, et cetera, and I really appreciate your enthusiasm and your energy and your interest in this. Thank you so much. Anybody else like to comment? Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. My pleasure. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Next item, please. Next are consent items. Um, and um, we have one item, approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting. We have a motion, please, or is there any comment or discussion first? A motion to approve. Second. Seconded. Roll call, please. Commissioners Bursalian? Yes. Hojayan? Yes. Terian? Yes. Katyans? Yes. Chair Lambelot? Yes. Okay, next item on the I, agenda, I'm sorry, please. Can I just get a clarification on the on the minutes? I note yes. that from the last meeting, am I correct? That did we have a full commission at the last meeting? No. Yes. At the November fourteenth meeting? We did. Oh, okay. Um I, apparently Commissioner Perion did not attend right. the so. last meeting. On November. I, I'm only saying that because the November 14th minutes indicate that there were two absences, which would have been Commissioner Perry and Tatians. Yes. yes. And so, um, unless you've uh, watched the meeting minutes and can 
as to the accuracy of the minutes, then you may want to abstain from the I'll roll abstain. Call. Thank you. Shall we take a second roll call? With the correction. Well, I think we've got one abstention. Okay. I'll abstain as well. Okay, so we've got just the record would reflect that there are two abstentions and um, three S's. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, please. Next item are action items. Action item A, 2023-2026 um, strategic plan. One motion to approve the revised 2023-2026 CSW strategic plan prepared by the ad hoc committee. Two motion to approve the strategic plan be posted on the website of the commission. Three motion to approve a public hearing to be held at the next commission meeting on May 8th, 2023 to solicit feedback from community partners and the public on how to best implement the plan to meet the needs of the Glendale community. Dr. Bajin, could you please um, provide a report on this item? Yes. Uh, staff respectfully recommends that the Commission on the Status of Women approve the revised 2023-2026 CSW strategic plan prepared by the ad hoc committee. Staff further recommends that the strategic plan be posted on the website of the Commission for the public review for, for the public for review and for a public hearing to be held at the next commission meeting on May 8th, 2023, to solicit feedback from community partners and the public on how to best implement the plan to meet the needs of the Glendale community. During the last commission meeting, uh, a recommendation was uh, made to organize a public meeting to solicit input due to staffing shortages. Staff recommends foregoing of a public meeting and instead posting the approved strategic plan on the website of the commission for public review until the next commission meeting where a public hearing could be held during the commission meeting to solicit public input on how to best implement the plan to meet the needs of the community. Key community partners such as YMCA of Glendale and Pasadena, Soroptimist International of Glendale, Essencia Armenian Relief Society, Glendale Unified School District, Glendale Community College, and the three local hospitals will be notified about the proposed plan and the public hearing. Thank you, Dr. Bajian. Um, I'm opening this for discussion, and I would like to start out the discussion um, and explain that um, uh, Commissioner Perion and I are on the ad hoc committee for this strategic plan 2023 to 2026. In late September, I believe it was, we met with Ms. Powers and went over it. Um, we did some drafts subsequent to that. Um, we worked with Dr. Abaji and uh, further drafts, but, and I think Commissioner Perrion would like to comment too, but I would just like to point out some highlights. And one is that one of our goals was to streamline and consolidate the previous strategic plan into something that is um, more focused. And so you'll see that instead of four, uh, strategic goals, we ha now have three strategic priorities. Um, and um, the, the idea of having the um, meeting is to not, so ho hopefully we'll, um, if the commission, let me put this way, if the commission votes to approve the strategic plan tonight, then we will have the meeting in conjunction with, um, like public meeting in conjunction with our meeting in May, um, and the idea is that we would request um, strategic partners, partners in the community who do what we do, have the same focus, to give us thoughts on how we might implement it. So in other words, we'd be approving it. They wouldn't be saying, oh, change it to this or that. It would already be approved. The idea would be to have the community we serve tell us what they think we could do to implement it from their point of view. And those were the comments I wanted to make. Thank you, Chair Lambalot. And just to add to that, it was um, quite a privilege working on the ad hoc committee um, to um, um, uh, update the strategic, strategic plan. And I feel confident that this latest version is a, a lot more relevant and um, um, eliminates a lot of redundancies that um, seem to um, have been um, in previous versions. So I thank you, uh, Dr. Rajamian, for, um, um, Abajian, I'm sorry, for um, also uh, working on it and um, providing us with the final copy. 
And also I wanted to add that um, the ad hoc committees that we had prior um, always tracked the strategic plan and they would do so here as well. And we also have additional ad hoc committees. Obviously, the strategic plan ad hoc committee was a temporary and is a temporary one. Same with the report on the status of women and girls. Um, but we would um, have the ad hoc committees where hopefully most of the work is actually done and then presented to the commission tracking these. So any other questions? Have you had a chance to look at it, Greer? So obviously as a newcomer on the commission, I'm just wondering how do we track how we are kind of achieving these goals in the community? How do we track our progress as a council? Well, we don't have a formal way of doing it. I mean, hopefully we're, <laughs> we, hopefully we review the strategic plan periodically. And I think given that the ad hocs have in the past been tied to the priorities and would be tied to the priorities, when an ad hoc committee meets and does its work, they should be looking at what the what their strategic priority is and you know the bullet points that we've suggested under there and the explanation to guide them in their their work and their suggestions as i understand Mr. It, after approve after when we approve you are going to contact all the other organizations that or would be presented to them it would be posted on our website. Hopefully we'll be putting more on the, our, the commission's website page. Um, and it would be there. And then we would be, yes, reaching out to the various commission. And we would ask that you think about um, people, organizations that you think we should contact and invite to the next meeting. Okay. Yes. I'd like to thank uh, both of you and Dr. Bajian for all the hard work and you know, making it more concise and cohesive and getting rid of the third or the fourth ad hoc uh, committee or the ad, ad hoc uh, strategic plan. So thank you for the hard work on that. It looks good. You're welcome. It's a hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Do you feel like we're ready to make a motion or do you need, anybody need more time? No. Okay, so the first motion that we are looking at, uh, the first alternative would be a motion to approve, um, would be a motion to approve accepting this revised 2023-2026 um, commission strategic plan prepared by the ad hoc committee, which is in your materials. I motion to approve. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioners Bursalian? Yes. Ojayan? Yes. Therian? Yes. Tatian? Yes. Chair Lamuad? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then also on alternative two in the materials is approve the motion accepting the strategic plan be posted on the website of the commission. I'll move. I'll second. Roll call. Commissioners Bursalian? Yes. Ojayan? Yes. Perian? Yes. Tatians? Yes. Chair Lamuad? Yes. And alternative three is to approve the motion accepting a public hearing to be held at the next commission meeting. So it would be at the same time in conjunction with our meeting. Um, on May 8, 2023, to solicit feedback from community partners and the public on how best to implement the plan to meet the needs of the Glendale community. I, would, I approve. So but do you want to make a um, motion? Yes, to approve the end. This but I think. Yep. Do you have a comment, Commissioner Perrion? Um, yes. Um, I, I would like to know if um, prior to our next commission meeting uh, regarding this, um, um, having um, the public hearing uh, at that meeting, would we be providing any sort of guidelines uh, to the participants so we are able to you know, keep it on point? Um, so the idea is to post this for public review until the next commission meeting. And at the commission meeting, we could solicit public feedback, public comments during the hearing. We can open a public hearing and, um, and uh, 
just like community, oral communication, et cetera, community announcement. You can set a time, time frame on how long you want the public, each, each person to comment. It could be two or three minutes. So then that would be the form where they would provide public comments on the strategic plan. Uh, we, we can also put something on the website saying the commission welcomes input on how you think could best implement this plan to meet the needs of the community. Thank you. Um, uh, my concern is more in terms of um, what sort of a disclaimer we would put out there so that not everyone, you know, I'm sure we are going to get a lot of fantastic ideas and, you know, we're going to have to come up with a way of uh, vetting those and coming up with what is best for the community and the commission. So I was just wondering if we're going to be posting anything like that or coming up with guidelines yeah. prior to that so people come in with expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, my understanding is that the way this would work is the public submitting comments to the commission and it's up to the commission, discretion of the commission to make a decision on what to include or what course of action to take. Yes, and as I understand it, the, the um, strategic plan has been approved as is. So none of the comments are going to result in a change in the plan. The, the, the word implement is, was purposeful. In other words, you know, one of our um, priorities, obviously priority on number two is, excuse me, is number three is education, awareness, and outreach. And we would anticipate that these partners are people that we would partner with, um, would, you know, there'd be outreach with them, they'd come to us and say, we have this program, that sort of thing. So that's the kind of um, input we're looking for. And so we'll, you know, I think we'll try to make that clear in the language, you know. And obviously, you know, nothing would be, f would be actually added to the strategic plan. It would be a matter of, that for, for instance, whoever is on the um, ad hoc committee for strategic priority three, education awareness and outreach, could take those suggestions, those comments, and say, this is what we would like to do, this is what we'd like to present to the commission, was first brought up at the public hearing, et cetera. That would be the idea. I, I agree, Chair Lambert and commissioners. Um, I think the ad hoc committee would be a good place to, to go through the public comments and see what would be uh, fitting for the commission to take on as a project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, then we're looking to see, uh, do we have a motion to approve? Um, alternative three. I was going to approve this. You're making the yes, motion? Yes, I'm making the motion to approve. Is there a second? I second. Roll call, please. Commissioners Broussalian? Yes. Ojayan? Yes. Sarian? Yes. Tatian? Yes. Chair Lambois? Yes. Thank you. Next item in the agenda, please. Next item, action item uh, B, motion for proclamations from Glendale City Council. One motion requesting a proclamation from Glendale City Council designating March 2023 as Women's History Month and March 8, 2023 as International Women's Day. Two, motion requesting a proclamation from Glendale City Council designating April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and April 26, 2023 as Denim Day. Thank you. May I have a report, brief, please? Staff respectfully re uh, request that uh, to authorize the Commission on the Status of Women sponsorship. Sorry, I apologize. I'm on the wrong item. <laughs> <laughs> um, staff respectfully recommends that the Commission on the Status of Women provide direction on requesting two proclamations from the Glendale City Council, one designating March 2023 as Women's History Month and March 8th, 2023 as International Women's Day and another designating April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and April 26, 2023 as Denim Day. Similar pro proclamations were made last year by City Council upon the request of the Commission in an effort to promote awareness and education to the community regarding issues pertaining to women. Thank you, it's now open for discussion this item. Anyone? 
Okay, I, mean, I would like to make a comment that um, it looks like the, um, assuming that a motion, these motions are made and approved by the commission, the um, first proclamation um, would be uh, presented to us at the city council meeting of March 7th and the other at April 4. And generally um, the chair goes, but as many um, commission members as possible would be great. It would be great if you could show uh, up here. You know, usually this is done very close to the beginning of the meeting and, um, and just appear to show your support and to let the city council know we're doing our work. I have a comment. Um, are we gonna have any events uh, pertaining to these designated days? March 8th or March or April 26th. Are there going to be any events that anyone knows about or? The city was going to, um, not the city, something is happening at the mall. They're going to have a celebration for um, March 8th for International Women's Day. And we could somehow be involved with that, but um, I'm, I'm not really sure if anything else is happening with it. I think. Um, we could plan for the following year to do an event for International Women's Day because of the short amount of time and uh, the staff change, changing of staff. Um, we do not have enough time to plan for this year, but we could plan ahead for the following year. Yes, and that is, the, we were hoping this year to be able to do something, but for those reasons, we just didn't um, have the time, the timing didn't work out correctly. But um, for instance, one of the things we could do is vote to have an ad hoc committee that addresses just International Women's Day if we don't feel that it adequately falls under one of the strategic priorities. But that is something that we should, I think, we should plan on for next year, uh, even if we don't do an event on our own, we can certainly partner with another organization or the city. If I'm not mistaken, before we used to collaborate with YWCA. We used uh, to. That, well, you, that's on Domestic Violence, violence. Awareness Month and Purple Tie right. Awards. I don't think it's been International Women's Day. Okay, okay any further discussion on the proclamations? Okay, does anybody want to make uh, a motion regarding alternative one to approve the motion requesting two proclamations from Glendale City Council, March um, 2023 as Women's History Month and March 8th as International Women's Day and another designating April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and April 26th as Denim Day? Um, I'll make the motion for both proclamations. I second it. Roll call, please. Commissioners Bersalian? Yes. Kojayan? Yes. Darian? Yes. Patian? Yes. Chair Lamalak? Yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Next item, action item C, update on sponsorship of Glendale Unified School District for Yellow Ribbon Week. Hands and words are not for hurting project. One, motion approving the purchase of items for the sponsorship of Hands and Words Project Anti-Violence Program including the allocation of an additional amount of $930.50 towards the materials requested by Glendale Unified School District. I would, um, this is open for discussion. I would like to um, point out that we did um, approve at our last meeting, we approved a, an amount of 3,200, but the school district, as I understand it, Dr. Bajian actually requested additional items. Correct, the school district, based on the number of students that they had at the elementary and secondary level, requested additional wrist, wristbands and additional materials that amounted to a, an additional $930.50. Okay. In and I'd also like to mention that on January 24th, I believe it was, I appeared at the Glendale Unified School Board meeting and um, Vice Chair um, Kajayan was there as well. And um, we had a, I had a, a couple of minute comment on um, explaining what we did as far as the funding and what it purchased and that we were happy to partner with the school district and happy to, um, um, be part of this again. And historically, uh, a number of years ago, the commission apparently did fund these items, but we haven't for several years. So we were happy to be a part of it. And so we, we said that publicly at the school board meeting. 
What's the total amount? Uh, the total nine, amount will be um, nine hundred. Total additional amount? Well, no, the total is total. four thousand one hundred thirty dollars and fifty cents. I'm sorry, how much again? Four, four thousand one hundred thirty dollars and fifty cents. It's on page, it's page six. six. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So we've already given them the original amount of money, but they're requesting more money for more materials. I think we actually, yes. We haven't. No, they, we, would you like to explain? Yes. Um, we had to, uh, the clerk's office paid in, uh, for, for these expenses and we're hoping to get the reimbursement of the full amount from the commission. Oh, okay, including the, okay. And the items were purchased and distributed. Mm -hmm. And you can see um, the receipt is included in your packet. That's very thorough. Yeah. <laughs> Any mm. other so questions? Did they just underestimate the cost when they, they requested additional materials? I think you said for high school it wasn't they originally requested in the additional materials because all of all of the schools are um, will we'll be participating in this program, including 20 elementary, four middle, and five high schools. They requested additional wristbands. So, but they didn't let the commission know before they, they didn't originally request them. It was an additional request. They additionally yeah. requested, but they didn't run it by the commission and just expected us to cover it. Or, well, um, I'm just curious. It was an estimation. Yeah. Okay. It was just a rough. They didn't know exactly. Okay. I think the commission. Yeah, I think estimated the amount of uh, money exactly. it would take to purchase I enough see. wristbands okay. for. And everyone. so they did amend their request. Mm -hmm. Yes, after the last meeting. Okay. And we opted to um, go ahead and um, provide those. And if the commission voted not to reimburse us, then we would um, deal with that separately. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. All right, thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, um, roll call please. Oh, we need a motion. We need a motion to, oh, to authorize this payment. I make a motion to authorize this payment or approval. Approve this, yes, we've already made it. I will second, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. This is to authorize the extra $930. Yes. Yes. Okay, all right, I'll second. Roll call, please. Commissioners Bursalian? Yes. Ojayan? Yes. Perian? Yes. Katian? Yes. Claire Lamlot? Yes. Um, Dr. Bajian, would like the record to reflect that student ex officio Gonzalez has now joined us. Yes. Thank you. Noted. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, please. Next item are reports, information only. We have a legislative update by Kiara Ross from Emmanuel Jones and Associates. That's the city, that's our city's lobbying firm. And uh, Kiara will be giving the updates, so we'll go. <laughs> good evening. Ahead, go ahead, you can share your presentation. Welcome. Uh, good evening, so I'm Kiara Ross and I am with Emmanuel Jones and we are your contract lobbyists in Sacramento and we lobby on behalf of the city before the state legislature. Um, and so I was going to share a quick update on what happened with some of the bills that you looked at last year, and then talk a little bit about what's going on um, at this point in Sacramento and where we are in the legislative session. So with that, let me um, share the screen very quickly. There we go. Okay, let me put it in the presentation mode. Um, so last year, um, you took positions on seven bills, four of which were signed into law, two failed in the legislative process, um, AB 2024, which was held in Senate Appropriations, and SB 976, which failed in the Assembly Education Committee. And then the, the four that were chaptered were AB 1467 on student safety and uh, 2185, and AB 914, and then um, AB 1207. And then one of the bills was vetoed by the governor, and that was SB 974 by Mr. Portentino, or Senator Portentino. 
and it was vetoed for two reasons. Uh, one, that they this was a bill that would have required insurance companies to cover diagnostic imaging for mammograms above and beyond what are already covered today um, and, and at no cost to the consumer. Um, and the governor vetoed it for two reasons. One, it, the additional diagnostic imaging that was that was required by this bill is not part of the national standard that exists today. And then two of the costs that the governor noted that the increase in premium statewide would be about $117 million. And he noted that the state tries to weigh potential benefits of all of the mandates with a comprehensive cost to the entire delivery system. Um, and so what that brings us to is at the end of every legislative session, which are two years in length, the legislature wraps everything up and all bills are either signed into law or they are vetoed or they die in the system, in the legislative process. And we sort of start anew at the beginning of the two year legislative session. We started that in January, so last month. Members came back and we are in the first year of the 2023-2024 legislative session. Um, our first big deadline is this Friday, which is the legislative bill introduction deadline. Um, as of this morning, we, the legislators have introduced just over a thousand bills, 1,084, um, and they expect between now and this Friday, we'll expect to see another thousand to 1,500 bills that are introduced. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this for a moment. Um, and so a lot of bills are coming in. At this point in the process, about 40% of the bills that have been introduced are what are called spot, are really placeholder bills. Um, and they're really a holding, they have language in there that's not entirely ready to go. And it's, um, it's it, it says, it, it, they typically will say it's an intent to do something. It doesn't actually do anything at this point. And so we really watch a lot of those bills at this point in the process. We wanna actually see what they're going to, to do. We wanna see the, the language really get into them. And so we're watching a couple of those bills to take positions on later in the year. Um, one though that we are uh, watching very closely that is really not spot bill forum that we think would be of interest to the commission is SB 970, excuse me, is SB 257, which is the reintroduction of the bill we just talked about, SB 974 on medical diagnostic imaging that Senator Portantino uh, did last year that was vetoed by the governor. And he has reintroduced that bill this year as SB 257. So that, that bill will probably bring back to you in May to take a position on. And we're watching a number of others, as I noted, that are, uh, we think potentially could turn into good bills for you to take positions on. Um, so I'll kind of, st I'll stop there and see if there are any particular questions. Anyone have any comments or questions? Okay, I'd like to say thank you. Um, it's wonderful to put a, a face to our report <laughs> that we get um, each um, time, and I appreciate you being there for questions. I'm sorry we don't have any. You, often we do, but it looks. I think just because things are sort of in a holding pattern, and there isn't, um, you know, we don't actually take action this time on support or not support. But we look forward to you coming back again in the future. We really appreciate it. Chair Lamblot. Sorry, I, we, I, we do have a comment I or do, question. I just thought of it. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is, um, when a bill is reintroduced, um, does the wording change? Does um, how much of it does it have to change for it to become a new bill? Um, so I was, I'm just curious uh, about that uh, regarding SB 974 which has been vetoed. So what is going to be the difference with SB 257? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so they don't have to technically change anything. They could, re the author could reintroduce the exact language, which the language he's introduced is pretty much the same language as the last bill at this point, but he's gonna have to make changes in the process um, and either lobby the governor to want to sign this or make changes that will appease the governor to get a signature. So um, I would anticipate the changes will happen with that bill at some point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question really quick too. Okay, Greer. Um, so with SB, was it two five? No, that's the old one, 974. So what did the support look like behind that bill? I mean, obviously it passed through 
both houses, but was there a strong support, especially in the community? Or I don't know if you know. There, there was strong support on that bill, especially from the medical community. Um, there was, there's a lot of support behind it. Um, and it's not out of the norm to see bills like this that try to go above and beyond what existing standards are out there because for a number of reasons. But in this case, because the, the medical community and the supporters all felt that they should, the insurance companies should be covering the diagnostic imaging for mammograms and it shouldn't be um, at, at cost to the consumer. Um, so I, this one really, I think, came down to two things. I think it, there was pushback from insurance companies regarding that this went above and beyond the existing standards, and then also the cost that was going to be passed on was some concern to the governor. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bajian, next item on the agenda, please. Next item are commission on the status of women and staff comments. Okay, does anybody have uh, any comments they'd like to make on um, anything that's been happening and they've done, anything they'd like the commission or the public to know about? Commissioner Kajaya? Okay, I would like to welcome and congratulate Commissioner Tatiana. I think with your experience and our experience, we can reach our goal. Thank you. We're happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome. 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 Anything else? Um, I was hoping to make a little bit of a report on my project I brought up to the commission, I think last meeting or the meeting before. Mm -hmm. um, I changed it from Supergirl Sundays to Saturdays because the library is, has a um, staffing shortage right now, but I ran officially my first program on February 1st. Um, the attendance was decent just because we weren't able to get anything out really in time for the program to start, but we had some little kids show up. We did a craft and we read a book. Um, and we have five more sessions coming up. It's once a month um, on March 4th, April 1st, um, May 13th, June 10th, and July 8th. Um, can you tell us, can you give, I can give you a recap on yeah, the program, recap sorry. The background. Um, so my program basically is to help with girl empowerment in the community um, and just kind of empower girls, but also it's open to obviously any child's about, I think we put three plus. Um, and basically on Saturday, kids come in, we have a little song about girl empowerment, and then we read a story. We read Ada Twist the Scientist was our first book, and then we made um, Lava Lamps, which was actually really cool. The kids really liked it. Um, but it's kind of just to introduce the idea of girl empowerment at a young age, because sometimes, I mean, it kind of depends on the school, especially with our district, on whether they kind of start bringing in those ideas, which I think is important, especially for our goals as a commission. Um, but I don't, I think we voted to sponsor the program, but it's fully funded by the library. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping to kind of build a community and hopefully have kids who are coming every session. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. I think we had, you had brought up the idea. I don't think we have flushed it out, um, at, at this level, mm -hmm. but, um, I know I on the ad hoc level, I thought it was, you know, a good idea. And then possibly we can do something uh, going forward in the future if the ad hocs come back with a suggestion and the commission's interested in doing it. Yes. Would you mind uh, sharing the dates, times, locations yeah. um, with the commission, just in case anybody is available yeah. to, yeah. you know, show up briefly? I, I think we have an official flyer. I can send it. To send it to Dr. Bajian yeah. and she will okay. um, distribute it. Sure. Other than the library announcing it, are you announcing it in the schools or how are you getting the message across that this is happening? Um, I'm, I'm working on speaking to principals at the individual GUSD schools to kind of spread the word at elementary schools, but it's definitely a slow, tedious process. So is it meant for elementary children? Like what's the age? Um, officially, we're, we've been advertising it as three plus, so we're probably looking at anywhere from kindergarten before kindergarten to maybe second or third grade. 
And this originated at your school and you have a faculty sponsor, is that correct? No, I actually just originated it as an idea through the council. I was working with Ms. Powers on it, um, but just with the legislative process being so slow, I ended up um, talking directly to the library and they just said they could pull funding completely from their budget in the kids' So library. you're running it yourself? Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Incredibly impressive. Thank you. Okay, uh, and does staff have any comments at this yes, point? Yes, I'd like to give a brief update on the City of Glendale report on the status of women. The ad hoc committee has received and is currently reviewing the draft report from Mount St. Mary's University, the entity that was commissioned to write the report. The ad hoc committee is in the process of reviewing the current draft and giving feedback to MSMU to complete the report and um, and the report, the final report that MSMU will submit to the commission will be on March 31st, that's their deadline. Um, once the report is submitted to the Women's Commission, the report will be posted on the commission website and will be agendized for approval during the May 8th meeting. And um, again, our community partners will be informed of this report and um, staff recommends holding a another public hearing uh, for this particular agenda item at the next commission meeting to solicit input on how to operationalize this report and support programming and initiatives that best serve women in our community. So um, that's, that's our recommendation because that, that was the language that was put in the initial grant we would need to get community input on, on, on the report. Right, right. And the ad hoc committee consists of me, basically, um, and Dr. Baj, at first Christine um, and I, Christine in particular, worked with Mount St. Mary's. Um, it, for those of you who don't know, we did a report on the status of women and girls back in 2015, 2016. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Kajayan. Um, yes, it was in conjunction with Mount St. Mary's. Yes, drafted it, um, and we worked with them on it. Um, and so this year, um, last year, you may remember Doc, uh, um, Christine Powers submitted a grant to the State California Commission on the Status of Women. They awarded us $25,000, which was terrific, so we don't have to take that out of our, um, our bank account. And um, so we had streamlined, some areas were streamlined. Um, there's a lot of language in there about COVID and the effects um, we wanted to do this actually earlier last year, but Mount St. Mary's recommended that we wait until the end of the year because the data they had was not, um, they, they didn't collect data during COVID that they felt was adequate to put in the report. So um, they've provided us with a draft. We are working on reviewing it and um, sending comments back. And, um, and the rest I think is clear from what Dr. Bajin said. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Any other comments? If not, we'll, we'll ask for a motion of adjournment. I motion to adjourn. I'll second.